My name is Lawrence Sumet. Uh, I am the CG supervisor at Vo Folks VFX in Toronto, a visual effects facility. Uh, I'm also a teacher of over 10 years at Centennial College uh, in the VFX program there. Um, so I'm very honored to, to moderate this panel today. So who's with us? We have Simon Devereaux, uh, who is, and I'm just checking my notes so I don't get this wrong, uh, the, uh, Simon runs the mentoring program globally at The Mill. Uh, covering a wider array of options for mentoring, including onboarding, career development, uh, leadership, transfer between studios, uh, parenting, and even maintaining diversity. Uh, he's also the director and founder of Access VFX, a global online e-mentoring platform. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, Alwyn Hunt. Uh, Alwyn is someone I've known uh, who has a passion for the industry and an interest in helping to create pathways for emerging artists to get into studios across the globe quickly. Uh, he's the co-founder of The Rookies, uh, which is an online platform to help digital artists get discovered. Uh, if you're a student and you're not on it, you should be. Uh, and he works in strategic business development at Adobe, helping users learn and connect with a substance. Also has a deep history in the visual effects uh, uh, industry as a texturing artist at places like MPC, DNEG, Animal Logic, Rising Sun, Weta Digital, uh, and a big list of awesome movies under his credit. Um, and on his left, Andrew Brassington, head of strategic projects at Escape Studios, which is a VFX animation games and motion graphics uh, school in London, part of Pearson College. Um, and uh, Andy is also the program director of uh, Producing VFX, the world's first course dedicated to training the next generation of VFX producers, which is actually really, really important. Uh, Escape Studios has a very deep history of teaching with industry professionals and helping students get very effective jobs at the world's biggest studios. Uh, and last but not least, we have Jurgen Hagler. Uh, I'm probably doing your name wrong. Oh, cool. I had one success today. That's good. Uh, he's a prof professor and program coordinator of the master's program of digital arts at the University of Arts and Scientists in Hagenburg. Um, Jurgen's program consists of project-focused work and a major share of teaching in the master's programs covered by visiting lecturers and industry professionals. He is also the director of the Ars Electronica Animation Festival, which you'll see a bit of here today. Cool, so that's us. Now, before we get into the talk, what's even more important is who is in the room with us here today? Hands up if you are a student. Okay, excellent, wow, awesome. Uh, hands up if you work in the industry, games, VFX, motion graphics. Okay, close enough. I think that's you. You work in the industry. We have some gentlemen who work in software here today. Um, and hands up if you're a teacher. Excellent. Cool. Okay, so I'm going to kick this off uh, to a question for the entire group, starting with Simon. Um, you devo devoted a lot of time to being a mentor. Uh, where did you start this process? What brought you to, to being a mentor? I should use this. Yeah, probably. Um, yeah. Uh, at the mill, it was, uh, I mentioned it briefly in my talk earlier, um, I recognized that there was a lot of mentoring that was happening um, in the studio, particularly the London studio. And the, the culture was built on the uh, particularly runners forging um, relationships with kind of 3D artists, 2D artists, whatever uh, career path they were, they were following. But it was all really kind of hodgepodge. <laughs> is, that, is that a word? You know, it's, it's sc it was scrappy. It was just, you know, runners were encouraged to get mentors themselves. And I wanted to almost create that platform for them just to save all the kind of um, hassle of having to, you know, put time in people's diaries because one of my things is not everybody's really confident and mm -hmm. it takes a level of confidence that not a lot of people have to go, right, can you be my mentor, please? But if you have somebody taking the reins and doing that for you and making that connection, you've removed that anxiety and then they can focus on their training and all that kind of rich stuff. So that's where it began with um, uh, a kind of a new starter kind of buddy system or as you said, onboarding. Um, you're connected to somebody, particularly as a runner. Uh, actually, we offer it to ev every member of staff, but our runners, for example, would get, if you want to be a 2D artist, you get a 2D artist as your mentor. 
but if you come in as an accountant or a HR person, we get you somebody for com from a completely different part of the business nice. to be your mentor for the first three, four months of your time at the mill. So you get a new perspective. So if you're a accountant, your um, mentor could be a creative director. So you get this real lovely perspective of another side of the business. So it's trying to both provide um, opportunities for our, our talent pipeline coming through, but also connect people within the studio. Nice. So that's kind of where it started out. Cool. Thank you. Alwyn, where did uh, it start for you? <clears throat> um, it started for, for the rookies 10 years ago, really. Um, and it was during, during our time working in London. We got approached by some of the universities to kind of help, you know, bridge that gap, which I was talking about earlier. Um, and they wanted us to, you know, just introduce them to industry standards. And it was, um, it was during, during the time working at MPC, and we, we recognized there wasn't really a platform out there that was helping a, a bigger audience. You know, we were working with one or two universities, but again, it wasn't really um, supporting a larger community. So the, the Rookies was, you know, born out of, uh, of, the, out of that initial uh, engagement with universities. Cool. Andrew. What was the question again? Sorry. The question was, what, what, <laughs> what flipped the switch? What got you started to, to be a mentor oh. to people, get into education? Yeah, I mean, I guess really it's because of my job. You know, I'm, I work in visual effects education, so just by default, I guess, really, um, but the, there's an, uh, a large amount of mentoring that happens there. But importantly, probably to say, that's in many ways, it's quite informal, actually. And it's something that we are working on at the moment is to put more formal mentoring in place. Mm. Because as Simon said, quite often it's the, uh, the confident ones, let's say, uh, that come forward and ask for help. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, I help as many people as I can in my, in my job and naturally I'm quite happy to do it. But I know that a lot of people are uh, too frightened to come forward. Um, so that's why it's good to have something more stretched. Simon's really kind of like paving the way for a lot of this mentoring back in London. Um, <clears throat> so his examples is really cool, actually. Um, does that answer the question or? I think it does. I've gone on. Please. Yeah, my approach, uh, I, I had the privilege uh, to start at Ars Electronica in the 90s as a student uh, to get in uh, an R&D facility to start uh, working on VR projects as a student and um, a couple of uh, weeks later I had the privilege to teach uh, at the university so this strong connection between the university and R&D facility uh, is an ongoing uh, since uh, over 20 years so since then uh, I'm connected to universities uh, teaching uh, and also uh, working uh, as a researcher in the field of media art uh, in combination with uh, animation and other stuff. And since 10 years, I am uh, uh, associated uh, and have the, the privilege to bring people uh, from the industry to teach. Cool. So I'll throw a next question to Andrew. You've, uh, you've spent a long time teaching and seeing people flourish in careers. Is there a success story that really sticks out for you that you remember? Okay, so at Escape, we've got quite a good um, reputation for taking people without any background in visual effects, um, you know, and uh, quite often, there's, there's a couple of, uh, of, of girls actually that came through that I remember interviewing them and they said, oh, you know, they've done like an English degree or something like that. And they thought, oh, you know, I've, re I've always been into this world. And this is quite an important point actually, because Anyway, the, the end of the story is they were brilliant, you know, and they learned loads and now they, they've got amazing careers, right? So the moral of the story in a way, I think, is something, most of the people in this room today, I guess, have made a decision to study visual effects, which is quite, um, you know, when we were, well, when I was younger, anyway, there, were, <laughs> there wasn't really anything, you know? And even having the idea that you wanted to get into the film industry or into the TV or something like that, I think was something that was all, for me, it felt like something that other people did, right? So like cool people do it. Oh, I'm not cool, I'm never gonna be able to do that. Uh, and so I think there's something around just letting people know that this industry, these industries take on people from 
across the spectrum, you know, and there's loads of jobs out there, all sorts of different jobs, and actually uh, just saying, just being confident enough to say, do you know what, I'd really like to work in visual effects. Having that confidence is a massive step forward and kind of vocalizing it. And if you're brave enough to do that, then somebody should be kind enough to help you on that journey. And that's where the mentoring thing comes in, I think. So, um, so for me, the, the, a lot of the success, the, the, the success stories that really stand out for me are people that were perhaps a little bit frightened of even acknowledging the fact that they wanted to get into this in the first place. And then when they, then when they get trained properly and people look after them properly and they go on to have amazing careers, it all seems pretty straightforward and quite easy, actually. It's not, it's not that hard. You just follow a path if you can, you know? Please. I was just going to say, there's, there's all my, you're hogging the microphones over there. We've got ours over here. Um, there's a real, I think the success for me is just the community of this industry, though, because I find that wherever mentoring program we push out there, whether it be through Access VFX or the mill, from my personal experience, people just want to give back. It sounds really corny, but visual effects people, the community, and I've, I've seen that in Belgrade as well from the, the various studios that we've kind of been hanging out in in the last few days, is there's a real love for the work and nobody kind of makes their money and then goes, right, I'm done, I'm out, right, I'm not going to help anybody else again. Every, there's, people want to give back because, as I said, there's this real informal like mentoring culture in visual effects. So it's almost a responsibility. Mm. I don't think you really have this in like banking or insurance or yeah, you know, maybe maybe you do, but um, I think it's inherent in the culture. Is that fair to say? I don't know. I'm just putting that out there as a, a broad success story, not an individual. Success. I've got lots of them as well. If you've got time, but oh, well, we need another panel for that. <laughs> if you have, we'd love to hear. Um, but if anybody else, anything comes to mind, sorry, yeah, sorry, please. Guys. You've got a microphone. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Uh, one thing I was going to say that I think is different now, perhaps from our generation with your generation is, again, that whole thing about be having the confidence to say you wanted to do something like this, you know, like I come from a, a part of the country that's not particularly, uh, you know, people don't work in the film industry sort of thing. Um, and I, you know, it's, how can I say this? Uh, I, I think... Uh, people are much kinder these days, I think. People are much, as Simon says, people are much kinder, often because they were treated quite badly themselves on their own journey. Uh, and I'm personally very happy to help anyone that I can, you know, as, as long as they're nice, really. If people are friendly and nice and have got good intentions, then, you know, it, that's all it really takes to start the conversation. So I would, um, you know, I would, I would urge everyone in the audience, if they want to make contact with people, just do it, you know, uh, and just be nice to people sort of thing. Yeah, from, from uh, uh, the perspective of, of the university, I think this is uh, uh, very important to encourage uh, students uh, to, to go to such events like uh, here in Bel Belgrade, uh, FMX or whatever, to meet the people in real and to talk to them. So uh, as a university, you can just uh, provide uh, a setting and the university is such as good as the students are and you can, uh, as a staff member, just support them and to bring uh, uh, the industry and the people together uh, to find uh, um, solutions. I think uh, recruiting uh, tips and all these things that are uh, uh, happening, are happening uh, at uh, these events are very, very important. And I think you brought up a, uh, some great points in that um, it's ultimately uh, a selfless act, uh, mentoring, and, and you're doing it just to be kind and help other people. But I, I found personally that living that way has helped me as well. So I'm curious if any of you have specific s scenarios where being a mentor and helping other people has actually come back to, to help you personally. Um, speaking, you know, from the rookies perspective, it's like, you know, you know, we help a lot of students out. So we get a lot of industry professionals coming on being judges and giving feedback. And these guys, you know, they're VFX supervisors, CG, you know, they're all top, top shelf people, but they recognize what we're trying to, trying to do through the rookies. And they know that their time is limited. So they go, you know what, we can do some judging. That's the least that we could possibly do. They might not be able to give full-on demo reel reviews but you know the fact that you're getting these industry heavyweights looking at your work as a student and recognizing your work from that stage is is, is massive I, I, 
find it's also the um, pe uh, people uh, mentee mentees becoming the mentors very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen that with our onboarding mentoring is uh, and, and and there's no barrier there's no age barrier to entry so you mentoring there's a bit of a myth that to be a mentor you've got to be some sage kind of gandalf figure who's been in the industry for years imparting wisdom like you can be two years in the game a year in the game you know, actually there's we do a lot of um, i'm a big believer in reverse mentoring and actually what typically happens in a decent mentoring relationship is the experienced person gets a lot of insight from the person who's been in the game for like half an hour and vice versa, the young person or the less experienced person gets a ton of experience from or best practice from the, the, the senior person. So there's a lot of myths associated with mentoring. And I just think, I mean, we've had runners come in as mentors, near peers, you know, it's, uh, I'm, a, I'm well into the near peer thing. You know, I'm getting sick of like a load of old blokes like us sitting on panels, telling people how to get, get a gig and, and it should be you lot speaking on a panel like this. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Get Sam up here. Yes, my mark. Well, um, just to sort of fo follow on from that as well. Like obviously, most of the people in the audience are quite young, but we all need we all need mentors. Like I haven't got a mentor at the moment, actually. So if anyone would like to mentor me, that would be brilliant. Because actually, I realise that I spend a lot of my time trying helping young people, but who's helping me, sort of thing. So Simon, I'm in. Thanks very much. <laughs> and then the other thing about the, uh, you know going back to like what's in it for us, you know, as being a mentor. Like, I genuinely hope that one day all of the people that I've mentored will look after me when I'm old. <laughs> and I write into a contract that I take 10% of their wages as well, sort of thing. So, it's, you know, it's not a completely selfless act, is it? You, there's a lot of satisfaction that comes from helping other people. And I guess there's a kind of a bit of a karma thing, maybe. And one thing I wrote down, actually, that I, I, as a kind of bit of a mantra, I think it's very important, personally, that people understand that nice people and also not just nice people, successful people, successful people in this industry share knowledge and they help other people. Like, I think there's often quite a temptation to kind of guard what you've got, like guard your work, like, you know, oh, I've worked out something, I'm not gonna tell anyone how to do this that keeps me above them. And yeah, there's an element of that, of course, but it's when you share knowledge with people, Everyone grows from it and it comes back round and, you know, that's the kind of uh, culture that's really important to foster, in my opinion. Yeah. And does, you know, just even looking at, um, you know, like the past 10 years and like the same mistakes, you know, that students are making, like that we were making, ten, you know, 10 years ago in the industry, we still see, and I think that's the most, almost frustrating thing is that it's these common things that keep happening that we're trying to, you know, that we're trying to change um, and I think, you know, that's, we're just trying to rectify a lot of mistakes that are being made and they have been for a long time. Um, I think, you know, that's, that's, that's extremely important. I think mentoring, decent mentoring again, nips all that in the bud as well. I mean, one of the reasons, a really simple reason we put in the, uh, the onboarding mentoring in at the mill was to just cut out all the messing around of working out, you know, who sits where and who do I speak to, to get a coffee and where's good for lunch and it, it just even just on a real basic level you know you don't spend your first few months just working out you know bs that you can just get sorted in a, a conversation because it's it, it's an enforced conversation it's a it gives back but it's uh yeah it, it's formalized so you know you've got a mentor now so you you yeah the, na the very nature of mentoring is you have to ask questions you're not going to sit down and go yeah you're all right yeah i'm all right yeah okay nice weather in it you know you're gonna you, you're gonna ask something insightful and get something out of it and I think on that note, um, a, a lot of studios have the concept of junior and senior. How does that, that make you feel, Simon? Well, I mean, it's just blatant age discrimination, isn't it, for me? I'm just, uh, I'm an ex-HR person, so um, junior just is demeaning. Senior makes you feel like you're really old. <laughs> um, I'm a, I'm, yeah, I mean, I, I, it's, a, it's a historic thing. I never judge anybody for using those terms. But it goes back to what I was saying earlier, you know, um, who would have, you know, uh, Pat Joseph, who was one of the founders of The Mill, for example, he always insisted, he signed up to the mentoring program straight away when we put it in place like six years ago. I mean, he's retired now. Um, and he insisted on having um, runners as his, um, as his mentees. Like he didn't want anyone else, he didn't want to mentor anyone else as one of the founders. He only wanted runners because he got so much from it. You know, so again, it just reinforces what I was saying earlier. Like, you know, mentors don't have to be seniors, you know. 
Right. Can I just cut in for one second, sorry, and just sort of go... In, it's, Eric, it's something that I heard yesterday from another speaker here, actually. I thought it was a really good, good point. Uh, you don't have to just have one mentor, by the way. And actually, it's like we all have strengths and weaknesses. And in a sense, as a mentor, you want to give that anyone the best bit of you. It's like, okay, take this bit of me because it's quite good. Forget the rest because that's a bit naff. But this other guy, he's really good at that other stuff. So he'll give you some of that. And actually getting a good m mentoring program in place, I would recommend or would say, is about f identifying people that have the, uh, either the skills or the knowledge or the connections that you would like to get yourself and, uh, and make a plan on how you're going to do it, you know? Um, and, and, and take a piece of as many people as you can, really. Yeah, that's true, actually. Sorry, to, I'm going to cut in again. Um, like when, when we train our mentors, we, we, that's what we talk about a lot, is we talk about that, you know, as a mentor, you, you don't have to have all the answers. And I think it's a misconception that your mentor is the expert in your field. And as Andy says, um, we, we encourage our mentors to open up your network. Mm. You know, so I, I'm mentoring a, actually a young lad from Escape Studios. Um, and... Uh, I mean, he wants to be an artist. I, I'm not an artist, but I know a lot of artists. So he can send me his reel, and I can send it to an artist, who, and he can get real-time feedback. So right. through, that's through the Access VFX platform. Um, so, that's yeah. a really good point, right? Um, one of the best pieces of advice I ever heard from a recruiter was, uh, if you want, um, don't try to be friends with me on LinkedIn, right? Because everyone wants to be friends with, with the recruiters, because you think that they're going to give you the job. but they just get completely inundated. Your best bet is to make friends with somebody on LinkedIn, which is really, if you're not on LinkedIn, I would definitely recommend using it for our industry particularly. Um, but find the person that is quite close, who's on the next step to you, and then try to make friends with them. And that takes a little bit of research, obviously. But, on, but to be honest, a lot of the time, these, if it's an artist, let's say, you know, they're sitting in a room on their, not on their own, but, you know, no, no one really talks to them that much. Everyone thinks it's about getting to know the recruiters, but the recruiters are just the kind of, almost the administrators, really, you know? So um, that's my advice. Cool. I'll throw this one to, to Alwyn. Uh, when someone comes to you and says, you know what, I'm, I'm interested in VFX. I know it exists. I see explosions in movies, but I don't know where to start. What do you tell them? Look for another industry. <laughs> <laughs> um, where do you start? You know, like <clears throat> there's actually there's so much. <clears throat> excuse me. There's so much content online, um, and there's you know we 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 talk about like creating a package which is like where you can download free software and, and go to the right places to learn you know really basic sort of stuff first. I think it's important to explore before you start spending money on courses. I think you know the you know the, the software. Licensing has changed in the last five years, and it's a lot more accessible. Um, and I think, yeah, just just play with it first before you you, you know dive into it. Makes sense. It it really to me it feels like you're drinking from a fire hose when you get started. Um, and so I'm curious, are there other strategies that you've seen work when you're introducing someone to the industry? Andrew, mm. oh, I say get on uh, Access VFX, shame as a blog, but um, we have a, a mentoring program um, that is uh, it's global, uh, you mentioned it earlier, uh, and we have, uh, because Access VFX is made up of like 50, or right, 40 animation VFX and game studios, and uh, 10 kind of establishments like um, UK Screen Alliance, for example, um, and we have mentors all feeding into that, and it's on an online platform, and then, it, and then we have mentors feeding into that from the US, Canada, and the UK. Um, and all over the world, we've got a mentor in Iran somewhere. The last time I looked at the stats too. So it's, it's cool. a global mentoring program. So I always say, if you're really interested, check out the website. But more importantly, sign up to the mentoring program. Anybody in this room, those, you guys have had your hands up earlier. If you want a mentor and you're serious about it, you can get one this afternoon. Or at least sign up and get one in maybe a week or so. Yeah. Um, but one of my missions coming here is to get people signed up to that program and get more industry mentors signed up to it as well. Because we need industry mentors. We need more animators. We need more games artists. We need more 2D and 3D artists to be able to do that. I want to talk more about Access VFX, which I will tomorrow at 11 o'clock. Um, so I'm not going to take over. But it's an incredible program. We're really proud of it. And it's all, it removes all the barriers of, sorry. <laughs> the, 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 you know, one of the big barriers of mentoring is time. Yeah. And as much as people love to give back in our industry, they are very busy. And it's a very demanding, as we all know, client-driven industry. 
Um, so to have a platform where you can meaningfully mentor somebody on a private Slack channel, and these are kids as young as 13 um, who can start, you can start to plant seeds, you can do it on your terms. You don't have to leave your suite. You don't even have to go home. Uh, you can do it on the train, you can do it on the commute, um, and it removes all the barriers. Plus, if there's another awkward barrier, which is who's going to want to mentor a 13-year-old kid in mm. the flesh? Are you going to go and have an awkward chat with a 13-year-old, have a flat white down in Soho? No, you're not. But you can do it on this, on this platform. So I'd like to talk more about it. But. Can I just cut in a second? I just want to talk about Access VFX for a while. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, no, it's, Access VFX is brilliant, obviously. And it is a very good way to... Um, to give that broad overview. And what I was going to say is, don't worry, um, like, you know, people's careers go all over the place in this industry. You might start out thinking that you want to be like a matte painter or something. You end up as a producer or vice versa, you know, and um, it, there's so much joy, really, in just being, you know, there can be any, well, there can be a lot of heartache as well, but there can be a lot of joy uh, on the journey. I would say just enjoy that journey, explore new things. Keep on moving. If you don't like something, just if you and if you can afford not to do it, then just don't do it anymore. Um, there's loads of exciting areas, and there's a lot. There's a lot of jobs in this industry uh, that you might not even realise exist. To be perfectly honest, you know, beyond being an artist um, or you know working in production or something really obvious, there's loads and loads of loads of, um, of avenues uh, to pursue. So. Let's bring uh, in uh, the university perspective. So it's a good question. Uh, in, at the end, uh, uh, is there um, uh, a student uh, production ready if, if there is uh, the university uh, focusing on uh, research and on other uh, things like theory? So is this quite important for, for the industry? And I think this is a, a decision that uh, uh, everybody has to to, to make, uh, if, if, if you want to go to, to the industry, I think there are, are great programs where you can specific uh, get into um, character animation, for example, and then it's not really necessary to, to uh, know a, a lot of things in um, um, closed uh, areas. But uh, I think, uh, and this is uh, a benefit that uh, uh, universities uh, can offer uh, to yeah, uh, give uh, the students uh, an insight into uh, the basic of uh, um, neighbor uh, disciplines so that you have the basis uh, to discuss with uh, all these other people. Uh, I, of course not. Uh, it is uh, um, um, the job of, of a university to, to uh, um, prepare if it's going more in, in, in science. Um, people for, for the industry. So you can prepare them that they can uh, um, go to the industry and to step into with a, a lot of uh, programs and efforts uh, and give them the place to specialize in their skills. And uh, in, in, in our program, we have graduates that are, of course, uh, um, production ready for uh, companies, uh, but they, they have to specialize during their studies and some of them are not uh, production ready for the industry because they are more focusing on, on research and they are uh, doing uh, prototypes uh, animation in, in virtual reality for uh, surveys and therefore it is not uh, um, necessary to have a, a production level for, for these prototypes. So this is a broad range a university can offer. Uh, and uh, um, special tracks uh, for uh, preparing the people for the industry uh, are um, welcome and they, of course, uh, uh, should be part of uh, university programs, but not only. If it's uh, thinking about a master program, at the end, a student has to be prepared for a PhD study and uh, this is something that is uh, theoretically, actually. Or, uh, what I was going to say is that um, I think just to be really kind of slightly fl not flippant but some people know exactly what they want to do uh, really young really really and they're kind of and they can be a bit daunting to be around can't they like oh my god this guy knows what he's up to you know this guy's like on the ball like oh my god I don't know what I'm doing and I think that it's absolutely fine if you're one of those to be any of those extremes and anywhere in between you know if you know exactly what you want to do 
then just go for it. And if you don't, just keep on looking. But just enjoy it. Like, don't worry about it, is my advice. Just do not worry about it, particularly when you're young. It's meant to be fun, you know? And explore it all as much as you can. Yeah, we get asked, we get asked that a lot, like, you know, about specialising and all the rest of it. And we were talking about this yesterday. And, and yes, you know, there are the big companies that want you to specialise in, in disciplines. But I think, you know, first and foremost, it's getting your foot in the door. And, like, you know, during times when even in big studios, it, you, you have down times, right? And they'll say, hey, maybe you can do some modelling or a little bit of lighting. So you get to you get to expand your experience in other departments and you get opportunities once you're in. So, you know, just get your foot in the door, get yourself in there, and then other opportunities will present themselves. And do you know what? Sorry to keep on. Tell me. That thing about like the stu what the studios want, right? What the studios want is for someone to be absolutely amazing at everything, right? That's what they want. They want you to be amazing. If, if they could get someone that could use Maya, Nuke, Houdini, do matte paintings, do everything, right? That's, a, that's the perfect thing. And then, because what the point I'm making is like, you can't be too skilled, you know? They'll, but the, what, the, what they'll want to do often is put you in a, what, put you in a, um, a box, let's say, you know? But you don't have to live in a box if you don't want to. So there's always that thing of, oh, you know, industry needs this, industry needs that. Oh, well, that's cool, but what do you need, you know? What do you need as an artist to be fulfilled? And so you should never forget that, actually, you know? And this is the funny thing about this industry. You have to remember, if I'm speaking mainly to artists here, you've got an artist sensibility, let's say, but that comes up against something quite hard, which is called business and money. So where do you, what, what are your boundaries on that kind of, I'm getting off the topic a bit here, I suppose, but um, it's that, you know, don't forget that this is meant to be an artistic, industry uh, that satisfies you in that way as well. You don't have to just become a robot or a machine. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll turn this around a bit. We've been talking about how to be a good mentor and you talked about giving the right advice and helping people find the right path. Um, but let me flip it around and say, what's the worst piece of advice you've ever given? And, and I can, while you're thinking about it, I can, I can jump in here and say, I once gave a student marriage advice, and that was absolutely the wrong thing to do. I do not, get, it was really stupid. Yeah, so I, I learned. Um, my wife is way smarter than me. She's, yeah. Anybody want to volunteer for that one? Or, yeah, you guys have all given perfect advice every time. That's it. Okay. To be honest, okay, if I can answer that then. Please. I generally try not to go with, like, buy, I try not to tell them. I try to just help them work it, work it through and get them to come to a decision, you know, just present options. Not like, a, you know, kind of almost like therapy, I suppose, isn't it? I, I know that my opinions are my opinions, and it's not up to me to put that onto someone else. I want them to think for themselves and to work it out. Um, which I know doesn't answer your question. I'm, I've probably given some dreadful advice to people over the years, but um, I can't think of, I, I actually can't think of anything really bad that I've said to anyone, actually. That's a tough one. Yeah, move on, move on. Next question. <laughs> Next. <laughs> I tried. Um, now, What's the best piece of advice you ever given? Yeah, why don't we, why don't we go, th <laughs> go through there? The yeah, oh, yeah oh, there you go. Uh, what is quite uh, challenging uh, um, is uh, for students uh, when they are getting uh, a lot of feedback and maybe feedback that is uh, totally different and uh, um, I, I would uh, prefer encourage uh, the students uh, uh, to judge uh, which feedback they, they really trust uh, and to, to see this as, as a very important uh, approach uh, because um, um, yeah this is something that that I am facing uh, when I'm uh, supervising projects and inviting people from the industry they, they give feedback and sometimes uh, it's it's not not the same feedback uh, 
and, 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 and then the students uh, don't know what to do. Uh, I think um, it, it always embraces a lot of feedback, but you have to handle it. So feedback without context can be yeah. confusing. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, I've, yeah. got, I've got one, actually. Okay. Do you want to go first? Yeah, the best piece of advice I ever had, actually, was from someone that was quite famous, and I won't say who it was because it sounds a bit name-droppy, but I knew, I, I used to hang out with them a little bit, and, and it was musician, two famous music, one, one famous musician, someone else. And I used to just, uh, used to, oh, you know, oh, I'd really like to get involved in uh, this, you know, kind of, and, uh, and they said, well, why don't you just do it then? And I was like, what, do you think I could? And yes, just do it. And so that was like the best piece of advice I ever had. But it was only because I got it from someone that I thought was like, you know, who was genuinely kind of very successful themselves. Other people had said the same thing to me in the past, but I hadn't taken that advice. So there's something in that, I think, of, and I'm a deeply unconfident person, you know, and I have been always. Uh, and so someone telling me, giving me good advice, sometimes you don't hear good advice, not because it's the, not because the words aren't good advice, but the person that delivers it, you don't trust maybe. So, and, and I think, you know, along with that as well, it's, it's, you, you need to have people that you sort of look up to. I remember, but remember when I was first getting into the, the industry and, and the, you know, this is back in, in Australia and there was a guy that had um, worked at ILM and he'd come back and, and he was giving a speech at the school and, um, you know, everyone was just in awe of this guy and we were just, you know, I didn't really get to know him, but I was just in my head, I'm like, you know, this guy from, a, you know, and he grew up in a country town of Australia and he ended up at ILM and, and um, you know, you need people to, to inspire you and motivate you and know that, uh, you know, there's people before you that have done this, you know, um, you know, and there's just the great feedback, but I think you always need people to inspire you. Even, even you know, once you've made it, you know, the, you can always push yourself further. There's always, once you reach that level, then you look for the next bit of inspiration and then you keep moving. You, you'll be surprised, like, how far you can go with it. I remember a bit of good feedback I had. Please. Just come to me. I feel like you've inspired me. It was just from Al, actually. It's just, uh, it was exactly that. No, it was, um, uh, I used to work in radio and the HR director there, who was an ex-commercial guy called Chris Scott, and he said he only hires people that are better than him. Hmm. So, you know, it comes back to one of my analogies is when you build a team, you, it's like assembling a crew for a heist. I love heist films. So you need the person driving the van, hacking into the mainframe, sticking up the jewelry store. Don't, don't perform a heist. Don't need to get arrested. But, you know, you need to have in that theory. multifaceted group of skills and you're not going to be brilliant at everything. It goes back to my point around being an expert. So I think uh, that's resonated with me. And, and I'll go back to something about the senior and junior thing. And, and me and Nick, we, you know, we used to work together in Toronto years and years ago. And we were, you know, there was, there was one story where this guy, you know, coming from DreamWorks and he'd built the pipeline and he was the next best thing, right? You know, and, you know, every, we were just all waiting for this guy to save the day. And he turns up and he was an absolute plonker. You know, he just, you know, and, and we see people coming through the rookies that are, you know, supposedly juniors entry level. And we looked at the work today. These, these guys are already rock stars, right? And there's, there's people that are already achieving. So you should never go, oh, I'm only a junior. I'm only entry. You, you, this classification, like Simon was saying, is, is, it's, a, it's an old fashioned uh, concept. And, you know, we get young people in the industry now that kick senior people's asses and you know it's just it's just the way it is yeah definitely that thing of like uh, you know the the, the the reputation precedes them you think, oh this guy's going to be amazing they turn out to just be pretty normal or even worse a lot of the time and the thing is like one thing that i quite often say when i address groups of young people and you look out to the audience and stuff like and where wherever it is around the world people generally look pretty much the same you know and what i would say is that everyone that i can see in this audience today would not look out of place. No one would look out of place working in the mill, for example, or at ILM, or at Framestore, or at any studio that I've ever been into, you know? So you mustn't ever think that you don't fit. That's my big message, really. That's the kind of, that's the thing that I like to push all the time to, to younger people. Like, you do fit in. You, you, are this, you are allowed to enter this industry. There isn't a gate that says no one from Belgrade can come into this, in you know what I mean? So, so would you say that the, the biggest challenge when being a mentor is building that confidence to, to face risk? Uh, sometimes it can be about bringing people down to earth a little bit as well, you know? Uh, 
So it can go both ways, kind of. Some people can get a bit ahead of them, a bit ahead of themselves. So I think often, you know, like so many things in life, it's just trying to find the balance. You know, raise someone's uh, confidence if it's a bit low, and just keep someone's feet on the ground if they're getting a little bit kind of. I think you always have to have a goal, like direction. The amount of times that we've been doing portfolio reviews, and you know, one of the first questions I ask is like, where do you, where do you want to work? Like, yeah. where's because that that immediately defines the path that you need to take. Is it feature animation? Is it visual effects? Is it short form? What what? Where do you want to work? Where's the ideal dream job for you. Um, and you, these are the questions that you really need to ask yourself even in you know, the first years of studying. I totally agree with that and I get all of my students to do that. I make them write down a list of certain things and one of the things I say to them is where do you want to work? Like, and they're going, mm. and it's teasing it out of them, right? Because what you want someone to say is I want to work at Pixar. Like, because it sounds so far-fetched, right? For some people they think I'll never work at Pixar. But you want to work at Pixar, so, you know, it's just having the confidence, or not even the confidence, but just, if you vocalise something, then it becomes a little bit realer. You're, you're, you're taking the first step towards making something real. For example, you know, if you met someone, let's say you go to a party, someone says to you, what do you do? And you say, I'm, um, you know, I am this. No one's going to question it. Oh, right, you're, oh, you're a visual effects artist, are you? Oh, that sounds cool. Rather than, well, I quite like to be a vision effects artist, but you know what I mean? Once you have the confidence to start saying what it is you want to do, you'll find that you have conversations with people and they'll go, oh, I know someone who works at Pixar, or, oh, do you really, you know? And it goes back to that whole LinkedIn thing, right? Once you've got that path, then you can go, okay, you know what, in LinkedIn, I don't need to worry about people that are working in visual effects because I'm fo focusing on feature animation. So you, you're effectively getting rid of a lot of noise very, very quickly. What you're trying to do is try and, you're trying to find the shortest path to get you know, to Pixar, right? So it's okay, I need to study in this area. I need to know these people. I need to you know, go to these conferences and event. And it's, just, it's really just defining that path as quickly as you possibly can. But, but sometimes students need time to find it. So they, they think they want to go in this direction and uh, then they, they are doing their first uh, small projects and they change their, their minds. So I think uh, uh, for, for this, uh, um, you need a lot of time, sometimes uh, even uh, uh, 10 years and then you change it totally what, what you're exactly doing. Oh, for uh, sure, yeah. yeah. And you might never achieve it, obviously, as well. Not everyone achieves their ambitions, you know, but it's a, it at least start out with, um, with, the, with like a bit of a plan, you know, and go for it, like Owen says, like just be quite focused on it. It doesn't mean that you can't then give up on it and then refocus on something else. That's absolutely fine. You're allowed to do that, you know. Um, in, in that note, I noticed, Andrew, on your LinkedIn profile, you have a previous career in geography. Yeah. <laughs> and so how did you, what got you to where you are and, and does it bring something to the table. Yeah, frankly, I think when I was younger, I came from a background where, because I was reasonably intelligent, I was able to go to university, but I came from a place where you just did traditional things. So I chose a kind of pretty easy academic subject and I wanted to, look, move, live, to live in London. That's what I wanted to do more than anything. So mm -hmm. I just chose a sub, went, found, just applied to all London universities. And I thought I was just gonna arrive in London. It's like, hey guys, I'm here, you know? the party can start sort of thing, you know? <laughs> um, and it, obviously it was a rude awakening for me and it took me a long time before I actually thought, God, you know what? I really want to work in something creative. It wasn't encouraged in me when I was younger at all in any way. Um, and so it took me ages to finally have the confidence to say, do you know what? I'm going to try and give this other thing a go. And don't go, and in many ways, to be honest, I sometimes wish that I hadn't, you know? I mean, I had quite, an you know, I was sort of working for, I started my career working for like the United Nations in a, in a kind of development, you know, kind of setting. Mm -hmm. But I knew it wasn't right for me. If I'd have stayed there, I probably would have had a very good life, you know, but I didn't. And I chose to follow something that, that I want, that in my heart I wanted to do. And I've still got ambitions, don't get me wrong. There's still things that I haven't, I would, well, there's loads of things obviously I haven't achieved. But even in my career, like I've taken paths that haven't really been exactly what I wanted to do, but I needed money sometimes, you know, and 
But, you know, we were talking about this last night. I'm at a point in my life where I need, might need to make some big decisions, you know? And that's really scary. Like, but there's something in my heart still that I need to pursue. You know, so don't, don't think that it's only when you're younger that it, life's a bit frightening, you know? Um, it's always That quite sounds like a good question for a mentor. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. Think about it when I'm mentoring him. Okay, good, yeah. Yeah. good point. Get um, in my arsenal. I'll throw this one to Alwyn and Simon. Um, clearly, there's been some great progress, especially from the people in this room. But if we look five, ten years down the road at where mentorship should be, what do you see be. changing? What Will do you be. see being different? You want to take this out? Uh, <laughs> he's going to work it through. Uh, I, I mean, I, when I talk about the, the Access VFX mentoring program or, or what we do at the mill, um, it's kind of plant, it planting seeds for when I'm not about, not dead or anything, but like when I'm not maybe, I might grow career change, I might move out of the industry. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a no-brainer. I mean, what you're doing is you're, you're forging, I, ho I hope, a more diverse um, visual effects, animation, and games industry. You know, everything we're doing, it's not just Access VFX, it's trying to promote a more inclusive and diverse industry because we are very white male and, and, and geeky. Yeah, there's just a I bunch of there old I said it. white dudes on the stage. Oh, yeah, here, loads is... of middle aged white dudes on the panel. No, but, um, Oh yeah, totally. But I, I, my, I guess my point is um, that I would want to, yeah, I, I think that's going to be the, the future. Everything we're doing, we're proactively taking action to create a more diverse future. So, so people who may not have that opportunity or awareness do have that. Yeah, which they already have through various programs. Yeah, and just, you know, globally, like we see the trend where there's more and more studios offering internships and apprenticeships and governments because of obviously, you know, um, the, 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 the tax credits and stuff like that, there's a real incentive for governments to get behind, you know, these types of industries. So with that, they know, you know, and industry are crying out saying, hey, we need support because there is these, you know, all, all these jobs coming and there's definitely not the talent coming through, right? So we're seeing more and more studios offering up internships and traineeships and apprenticeships and all these types of schemes. So, I mean, I know talking to Epic Games the other week, they've got 40 internships that they're doing for next year alone. You know, that's, that's 40 spots, you know, straight off the bat. So um, there's, there's definitely more of that type of thing happening. I think apprenticeships is an old fashioned type term and, and is, you know, even internships in the, in the US, there's, it's labeled and it's not really, but it's all changing. They know that there needs to be whatever that is called, some sort of program or system that um, young people can come into and get trained up. Yeah, the entry point, sorry. I think it could probably become a bit better organized, you know, some algorithms could be introduced probably by someone that works out, you know, actually, you know, this person needs a mentor to help them with their social skills, let's say, and this person needs a mentor to help them with their software skills, or maybe there's more checklist of, of certain things that you can say that you've improved on because it is often very informal like mentoring you know define you know it can be as defined mentoring you know yeah. which we haven't really done in this discussion i suppose um so it can it, i think it would and mentoring is a big thing across lots of industries at the moment particularly in the uk anyway you hear it everywhere um and it's quite fashionable i don't think it's it's not just a fashion though it's a it's something that will stick around you know so the point to cut a long story short, what I'm trying to say, I suppose, is I think it will become more formalized and more measurable, let's say. I think that would be good. Makes sense. Jurgen, is that something you're seeing in the university side, a, a more formal approach to mentorship, or do you see that coming about in the future? Um, yeah, uh, good question. Uh, so, um, I, th I think uh, uh, if I have a wish for uh, um, um, study or a program in five years uh, I see a strong connection uh, of course between uh, the industry and uh, uh, academia uh, and I also think about uh, uh, new um, programs that are um, maybe more connected to art universities so if, uh, if it's uh, um, about uh, thinking about a bachelor uh, uh, degrees. So, is it really necessary to, to write uh, an article or a short paper? So, what what kind of uh, um, 
final decree do you get for for your practice based uh, uh, programs and I think there is a um, there is, there should be more uh, discussion about what what is really um, the future of uh, um, uh, uh, academia in mm -hmm. bachelor degrees master degrees uh, and, and I I have the feeling that uh, there will be of course uh, uh, tracks with a, a focus and also uh, places where you have a, a broad education where you can find your ways and just have the place to find uh, your interest uh, this is also a uh, university has to to offer mm -hmm. to have just uh, uh, time to find what is uh, uh, in your mind and what you want to do and uh, this is something that is very very important uh, because uh, uh, after you uh, have finished your study then you are in the industry and it's of course some people are always getting back to universities and uh, are studying but uh, this is a very privileged time where you can do whatever you want and this yep. is something that we that, you, that the university has to support in the future as well makes sense so um, we're gonna go to q and I think that was some great discussion um, we have some of the best mentors in, in the industry here today, so I encourage everybody to take the advantage. Um, but just before you do, uh, very quickly, a question for Simon. Uh, for the people in the room who are thinking, I want to be a mentor, this sounds really cool, what's the one thing they should be doing? Sign up. Sign up That's for simple. Access VFX. Okay. Take one of these, there seriously. It's free. It's, it's, it's free. free. It's free. It's free. It's It's free. It's free. It's free. It's free. Thank you. But yeah, seriously. Um, it's free. Everything Axis VFX does is free. Um, if you, I, whenever we, I do a lot of uh, speaking engagements, I know there's some questions. Is um, I always set, I always challenge the students in the room. And I say I bet only two of you. I'm sorry. I bet only two of you come and get a card or come and get it. And I'm challenging you guys. If you're serious about Korean visual effects, this is a no-brainer. It's free. You know what? You might get a mentor. It might not work out, but it doesn't cost you anything. It's, just, it's apart from logging onto the computer. I don't know. I just. I bet one person will. I always get one person. All right, no one. There you go. Challenge. But yeah, sign up. And, and all the professionals here, sign up. Because it's not just about the mentees. It's about the mentors as well. Absolutely. Thank you, gentlemen. Any questions from the crowd? Um, good evening. Uh, do you mind if I sit down? Because I'm really tired. <laughs> you can lie down if you want. Lie down. Lie down. Lie down. Yeah, <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so <laughs> it's, I would like to ask a question about like artists' work in this age. The content consumption is up, and uh, shorter and shorter formats are being created for consumption of content. Um, automation in the industry uh, plus consumption of content will inevitably create more and more content. So, do you think? that uh, growth of the industry uh, is going to mean that artists' work will be less appreciated as a, as a whole? I think a little dark question, but I'd like to get your thoughts on that. I think that the industry will always need artists. <clears throat> Some jobs will become obsolete. That's just the nature of like mechanization, industrialization. It's the nature of life. Things come and go. Uh, you might want to choose quite carefully what it is you want to get into. You know, <clears throat> how long is rotoscoping going to be around for? You know, how long is, uh, well, how long is live action filming going to be around for? Who knows? Uh, but I would also say as well, do the thing that you love, not the thing that, well, it depends, it's up to you. Well, I would say consider, do the thing you love rather than w what you think is going to make you money. I mean, for the, fir the first thing to say is like, if you're really into money, I'm not saying you are, by the way, but if you're really into money, go and work in a bank, like, you know, uh, do something different. If you're into art, well, there aren't many jobs as an artist that you can get, actually, that pay you this well and give you a career. You know, visual effects world does still allow you to be an artist to a certain degrees, depending on your level. Some jobs are very artistic, some jobs are less artistic. Uh, it depends how much that means to you. But also, it's obviously something you've got to think about as you go forward in... What are you studying? Animation. In engineering. Hey, everyone needs animators. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, animation probably, you know, animation's well, changed already. You've got, you know, with... I'd like to, I'd like to make let's, games let's, for a living. Let's just, I'll just add to that as it's, well. At the end of the day, like, you're, you're asking about appreciation and, you know, your work and all that. You know, we've worked on films where we've done little things that sit in the background, but I've been really proud of it because I enjoyed working on that. So I think, you know, it, it's about you really appreciating your work, you know, and it's the journey that you're on, even once you've seen it on the big screen or whatever it is, it's, it's that journey that you need to enjoy. I think, you know, it's, it's not about other people appreciating your work. You know, what, you know, when you're getting to hero characters and stuff like that, and it's, you know, it's like full screen, then, you know, but um, it, it's the journey that you're on when you're working in the, in the film industry that you should appreciate. And I think, too, it's the how that might change, but the what, what you're trying to do, is it's going to stick around and probably just grow. So think more about the what and where you're going and worry less about the how and be open to changing how you do something, I think will have a big impact. Thank you. Hi there. I think I have a tough one. Another one. Another one, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so I think we could agree that this is a male-dominated industry, right? I mean, all of the speakers we heard today are white men, and the speakers we heard last year and the year before are also white dudes, right? Yes. So um, I just think that, I mean, I, I want to know that if you, as mentors, do you get fewer female students or is it just that it's more tough on girls to get into the industry? What would you say, what was the full question there? The, do you uh, think that it's more difficult for girls to get into the industry or is it just that there are fewer girls that are studying VFX and animation? I think a lot of girls are studying. I mean, a lot of the colleges I've gone to, I mean, we, uh, back in London, we met, uh, Oxbridge College came in and it was all girls. It was crazy. There's one boy there. I almost felt sorry for him. Uh, um, there, uh, there's some, for something's happening between, uh, for me, the education and work. And I've read, um, there's lots of kind of diversity papers and there's a lot of chat about diversity. I get it. But um, there's this um, kind of uh, fact that's doing the rounds where if you're a man you will, and, and you've only got half of the skill set, you know, you'll probably take a punt and apply. And if you're a woman, uh, you'll only apply for a job if you tick all the boxes. And I don't know whether that's a, a gender thing, a psychological thing. I don't think it's applicable. I don't like tarnishing different genders with the same brush. Uh, but something's happening. Um, I don't think it's an issue in education. I think, again, coming back to the work we're trying to do here, we're, we're encouraging, we're targeting. Um, a lot of the work that I'm doing is getting out to kind of girls' schools and working with um, lots, of, uh, lots of women um, uh, and trying to encourage them, not just at a young age, but getting... There's another issue at the other end when um, people start families. And if you're working in the wrong culture, you end up not being able to get back into industry once you've started your family. So there's a lot of work happening on what we're calling returnships as well. So there are issues and challenges at both ends of the spectrum, for sure. I think, too, I'll just throw in, um, we, we were talking about that, you know, young people can be mentors, too. Young people have things to say that are valuable. I think you should talk to the organizers here and think about what you're going to present in CGA Belgrade 2020. I was just going to say to that, you know, like the... The mentality's changed as well, you know, like when we were, you know, getting into the industry, like I think there was a, you know, there's a lot of young people when playing games and it was, it was very male dominated, right? Like, and, and that's kind of been that, our generation. And now, like, the, like Simon was saying, there's a, a lot more women getting in. There's CG supervisors, there are high profile people doing amazing jobs. Um, and I know Mill Film, when they were setting up in Adelaide, like Lauren's agenda was to make it, you know, the studio 50-50, and she's been pushing, and she's, you know, I think she's pretty close to that, where it's 50-50, you know, which, so it's, it, it's definitely changed. It's not like it used to be, so I think, um, yeah. Just to expand on that as well, I would say now is a very good time to apply to into studios if you're female, because they actively encourage it. So in many ways, you're in a very good position, I would say, you know? But it's also a numbers game as well. I've just had a quick look around the room. How many boys, well, males, boys, or, I don't know, there seems to be slightly, le well, there's less, there's less females in here, I think, you know? So it's a numbers game, right? That, there is an element of that. I don't know, is it 50-50 in here, do you think? I think it's pretty Yeah, I mean, there's definitely, uh, you know, there's always, it's gonna take a, a, a number of years for, it's like a sales pipeline, isn't it? You know. You, how many people you've got coming into that funnel, you know, is going to, and then there's the, the, the longevity of that, if you like. But it's, 
just to spin it around, I would say it's a very good time for you to apply if you come from a minority, if you are female. It's a good time to apply because people are actively tr encouraging a more diverse workforce right now. So take your opportunities now, I would say. I'm glad you asked the question, sorry to hog, but um, one of the things about three years ago at the mill, we had a, a, a job. Sorry. Yeah, there was a job we did at the mill. So I'm saying we're not perfect, right? There was a job called uh, Audi. It was Audi Birth. And it was a, I'm not into cars, I don't even drive cars, but there was an Audi car and it was giving birth to a sporty Audi car. It was terrifying. I mean, it was, it was a really intense piece of uh, content, incredible piece of work. And then we did our first um, International Women's Day panel in 2016, 2017. So we had a, 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 I talked about it in my, my talk earlier. And I found out of that talk that not one woman worked on that job. And it's a job about childbirth. Do you know what I mean? So there are issues. I'm not going to sit here and say it's all sweetness and light. We've got a lot of work to do, but um, we're, we're very aware of that, the, uh, the lack of representation. Cool. And there's lots of schemes and programs that exist now. So Andy's absolutely right. Sorry, I completely stole it. Just from uh, as an electronic perspective, it, it's an issue. Uh, we have uh, a history of 40 years and we have a, a huge archive and we did uh, a lot of research on, on uh, uh, gender and uh, uh, diversity. Uh, and uh, I can tell you that this is uh, um, the, the initiative, uh, women in media arts, women in visual arts uh, are great in initiatives, but uh, um, uh, there is still something to do. Uh, because uh, uh, it's great, uh, as a professor, uh, I have a, a great uh, gender ratio in my course now, since 15 years. But uh, if I'm going to festivals, uh, uh, and looking at the uh, speakers list, there is not really a diversity. Uh, and this is something for us, Electronica, um, we have uh, uh, the order that uh, for jury members, we have a, f a balanced uh, situation. And this has, of course, an effect on uh, uh, the winning program, um, uh, projects as well. Uh, so this, is, this will be uh, quite uh, interesting to see how these uh, initiatives really will uh, go in the future. But it's there, there uh, as an institution like as Electronica, uh, you, it's an issue yeah, and you have to, to tackle it. Let me just say one last thing if it's okay. And I don't mind, I, this is not meant to sound flippant at all. And of course, everyone talks around this all the time. Everyone's aware of these issues, right? My advice to you is like, are you, what are you, an uh, animator? So are you a female animator or an animator? Like, just be a great animator. Like, just that's what you should think about yourself. I'm a brilliant animator. I'm not a brilliant, you know, I would just, uh, don't classify yourself like I'm a minor I'm minority, I'm this, I'm that, I'm a bit weird, I'm a bit mad. I'm, just be, hu you know, I don't think it's ha that helpful. Sell yourself as a brilliant artist. I'm a brilliant producer, right? I'm a brilliant artist. I'm, I know that's kind of off trend <laughs> to say it, like, I just think, just be brilliant at what you do as, and don't stigmatize yourself, perhaps, or allow yourself to be, you know, and, I, I like, and as I say, I'm not trying to make light of it, okay? That's a great question. Thank, yeah. you. Um, Thank you. Do we have time for any more questions? No, I'm oh, getting, man, I'm getting, getting no. Sorry. Eric's got one. Eric's, Eric's. Uh, I do have one. It might be a really relevant one for the room, too, but I don't know. Well, maybe we have to ask it after. Maybe just one quick one. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it might be a downer, but I, I feel like I, I need to ask it anyway, especially... You can ask it, but you may not do it. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll ask it where, where I am, and maybe we discuss it outside or not. But I think if you look at other industries, other jobs that people might get, you know, people build careers, they, they tend to stay in one place longer, and this kind of thing. If you look at our industry, not only do people move between studios, but I think when they're younger, it's expected that they're moving to different locations, right? And I think this 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 nature of moving around as much as people do at the beginning of the career is something that they're not prepared for. And so my question for you guys is looking at the people in this room, probably 80% of them are going to have their career start somewhere other than Belgrade. What advice would you give to them about how to set up their life around that kind of thing? Wow. I mean, that's where, um, sorry, it's all the microphones, so 
I think that's where mentoring comes in. I mean, the, um, I, mean I talked about the, the, the mill mentoring program around mill moves because that's exactly what happens at the mill is you come into London and the London studio feeds the, the US and, uh, and, and, and Bangalore at the moment. Um, so we have a local mentor in that studio who enables that person to, um, to bed into the, that community because uh, in a lot of cities, you're starting from scratch, aren't you? You're almost setting up a new, your own, a new social security. Your credit rating is then reset. You know, there's a, there's a whole heap of different cultural nuances that you have to, uh, that you have to do. And I think we need to find a way to uh, bring that into our respective global mentoring programs. I mean, the Actors VFX one, I mean, we were talking about this over dinner actually at the speakers uh, uh, dinner about taking the Axis VFX um, model and using it for industry because part of the Axis VFX model isn't just about outreach it's about supporting our community um, so there could be some scope there to, uh, to, to, to mentor people okay. specifically around something like that. Last word, right? Let me just say Final one word. last thing this is really important right in my opinion like there's some amazing stuff happening in Belgrade I, I think I've seen it with my own eyes. Don't be in such a rush to leave this city. Like, be careful what you wish for. Um, so that's that's what I would say. Like, you know, there's great stuff happening. London, who can, you know, whatever. It's really expensive as well. You know, don't not everything that glistens is gold. You know what I mean? The grass isn't always greener. Why not build your own industry here? That's my advice. Good advice. I'm getting but, the, unfortunately, we're out of time. I'll just say one last thing. Like, but if you do get an opportunity to move to a like, place like Vancouver because there's more jobs or whatever, to us after. then always look for people that are, that are already there. Like I know, like in Vancouver, there's lots of Brazilians that are working there and they've got a really tight community and they support each other, especially if they're coming into the industry. So there's always people that are in these cities that have already been through the same battles that you're about to go through. So don't be scared. Again, use LinkedIn to find people that you know or through friends that are already established and they will help you. Cool, thank you so much. <laughs>